to power is the reason I'm living. There is an unprecedented, epic transformation in human consciousness that's happening now. It's real power. When you change yourself, you put your attention inside yourself and change yourself with your own emotional awareness and volition. You're either in love or you're in fear. It's a matter of recognizing which one you're going to move forward in. That's the ability to create authentic power, to distinguish within yourself between love and fear, and choose love no matter what's happening inside of you, like depression, helplessness, hopelessness, rage, anger, and choosing love. If you intend to change the world, there's only one way you can do to change yourself. But here's the thing, if you're changing yourself in order to change the world, you're still pursuing external power. Whoa, guys, <laughs> welcome to this week's episode with none other than Gary Zukav, Seat of the Soul. Last time we had Gary on the podcast, we discussed the texture and the quality of understanding the difference between our personality and our soul, and fundamentally just how to be able to discern the difference between the two. How do we bring those two into alignment so we create what Gary calls authentic power? How do you create authentic power that is multi-sensory? Um, man, this is such a deep conversation. We dive deep into practical examples of Gary's own personal life, which, you know, there's some tender places in there and he was very gracious and willing to go there with us in terms of describing how he actively has chosen love over fear and pain and hurt again and again. Hey you there, Inspired Spirits. At the time of this recording, only 94% of you that are actually returning to watch a second or a third or a fourth video here on the Inspired Evolution podcast are actually subscribed. I can't tell you how much it genuinely helps everything we're trying to achieve with promoting positivity in the world through your subscription. Every time you hit subscribe, it helps us grow the platform. It lets guests that want to come onto the show know that you know it is worth their time to take the time out to carve out a conversation like the ones that you're enjoying here on the Inspired Evolution podcast. My personal commitment to you is as the show grows, you know, more and more quality, more and more conversations, richer and richer things will flow around here. That is my absolute commitment to you. To be completely transparent, as we grow and when we finally get to that 100,000 subscriber mark, currently we do two episodes a week. I'm looking forward to getting us to about three episodes a week so we can really keep the juju going and flowing at an even greater level. And all of that is enabled by you taking the time to hit subscribe, hit that bell notification. So if you can, Please take a moment, take a moment, come on, take one six, six, six. <laughs> hit subscribe and hit that bell notification icon. It helps so much more than I can say. Thank you so much. Welcome back to the Inspired Evolution. And we have with us Inspiring Our Evolution with us today, Gary Zukav. I was going to say dear Gary Zukav because it is very dear to us to have you here again. It is such a pleasure having you here again. Gary, welcome again to the show. Thank you, dear Amrit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is such a pleasure to have you here. For those that are tuning into Gary uh, for the first time, like I alluded to, there is another conversation that we've had on this episode, on this podcast. I highly recommend you go check that out. Um, Gary is an American spiritual teacher, the author of four consecutive New York Times bestsellers. He's appeared all over the world discussing profound transformations in human consciousness. And the concepts presented in his world-renowned and celebrated book, The Seed of the Soul, have, yeah, impacted the lives of incredible people, an incredible amount of people all over the world. And uh, humbly, I'm put both of my hands up in the air to sort of say, me too, me three. Um, it's been a really profound distillation of, yeah, just living a life that is um, connected to our soul and a, a greater awareness of something more. And uh, Gary, I wanted to sort of start off today's conversation because we had last time quite a wonderful um, conversation about the, the nature of our personality 
and the nature of our soul and being able to identify perhaps a little bit around the the different qualities and the textures of what personality feels like and what soul feels like. I wanted to go a little bit deeper today because your work also talks about this essence and I hear it again and again, tucked in almost, I want to say, in between many big topics um, of your work as the seam between a lot of bringing these ideas together, which is authentic power. Um, I see it present itself again and again in your work um, as a, I want to say it's a subtext, but it's it's quite profound in its own right. So, yeah, if you could share. Um, I don't know if you need to reintroduce the concept of um, soul and personality to describe authentic power, but I'd love to hear what you would describe authentic power as. Mm. Well, in our discussion uh, previously, we must have gotten involved and in enjoying each other. Um, but uh, authentic power is not tucked for me between anything. It is the reason I'm living. It is what I love to discuss. It is what um, Linda Francis, my uh, beloved, whose soul has returned home to non-physical reality, love to discuss, love to discuss. And so I'm so glad that you put the spotlight on authentic power. Um, because it is intimately involved with both personality and soul. We are in the midst, and, and this is my experience. So whatever I share with you, I share with the understanding that all of my experience is limited, and it's quite a limitation. To my experiences is Gary Zukav in this earth school. But from that perspective, what I have been taught and what I see is that there is an unprecedented, epic transformation in human consciousness that's happening now. It's been happening for about one human generation. And in another two human generations, everyone will have this new consciousness. The old consciousness was limited to the five senses. If something couldn't be seen or tasted or touched or heard or smelled, smelled, uh, it, it wasn't experienced as existing or as real. And the understanding of power, while we were confined to the five senses, was the ability to manipulate and control. What other understanding of power or experience of power could there have been when we were five sensory? But I'm not, we're not five century anymore. There are still more five century humans in the world than there are multi century, but that's changing rapidly. And from multi century perception, we see more. We still have our eyes, we still have our ears and five senses. Or we still have our intellect. I know my zip code and I know my passwords or how to get to them. But we see more than that. Um, let me give you an example of some multi-sensory questions. For example, if you've ever thought to yourself, I think I'm more than a body and a mind. I must be. That's a multi-sensory perception. If you've ever said to yourself, <clears throat> I think this world is more than random. I think it's meaningful. It may even be symbolic. It carries meaning. That is a multi-sensory perception. If you've ever found yourself knowing things about other people that your five senses couldn't have told you, these are multi-sensory experiences also. And we're all having them. We're becoming a multi-sensory species. This is our new defining characteristic. That's why I can speak to you in terms of the birth of your child. From a five-century perspective, it's going to be the coming into a larger physical domain of a tiny being that will mature and grow. From a multi-century perspective, it is the arrival of a soul, an immortal soul, into the domain of time and space and matter and fear. It is a dramatic act 
of spiritual responsibility in incarnation. And this is happening now as you await the arrival of your son, as you await the arrival of a soul that is not new to you, but will now be in a form that will require, will require a great deal of your attention as this personality matures and grows and nurtures. But souls do not mature. Personalities mature in the earth school. That's this domain of time and space and, and, and duality and matter. Souls evolve in eternity. And as we become multi-century, we become aware of ourselves both as personalities and as souls. We have a dual vision simultaneously. And the new understanding of power as we become multi-century is alignment of the personality with the soul. The old understanding of power, as I mentioned, is ability to manipulate and control. And as we move into this new domain of experience, multi-century perception, this older understanding of power as manipulation and control becomes obsolete. And more than that, much more than that, it becomes toxic. It used to be our good medicine. It used to, it used to enable us to survive. Now it's poison. It produces only violence and destruction. It's counterproductive to our evolution. It threatens our survival. This is the new domain of experience. And it's in this domain that I can speak to you of power authentic as opposed to external power. And that's what I love discussing. So is there anything I can clarify or... Yeah, absolutely. There's there's so much in there. Thank you so much for for describing that. The uh, before diving too much deeper, the the um, on a surface level, it sort of seems even the previous five sensory power, which was I imagine necessary for us as a species to get to where we are now, um, seems to be so much more externally focused as well. Um, whereas this multi sensory um, power that you're describing is this alignment between our soul and our personality seems much more internally focused. Um, am I safe in driving that as a conclusion? Precisely. Precisely. You are spot on. External power is focused outward. When we feel emotional pain and we were five sensory, we would reach outward to try to change the external world to feel better. If a child doesn't make it through birth, we conceive another. If a business fails, we build another. Uh, if a relationship unravels, we go outward to find another. That's external power. It's attempting to change the external world so that you will feel better about yourself or that a frightened part of your personality, to be more specific, um, will feel more secure. The opposite happens with authentic power. You put your attention inward instead of outward. You focus on what you are experiencing yourself and learn from it to change yourself, not the world. You look at what you're experiencing emotionally. This is emotional awareness. And it tells you whether you're in fear or whether you're in love. And you, it tells you in terms of your body. It's a somatic experience. You put your attention in, <clears throat> for example, if you have a painful, if you are frightened. Well, what does that mean, if you are frightened? It doesn't mean quivering. It means if you're angry, if you're resentful, if you're competitive, if you're jealous, if you're feeling superior, in, entitled, if you're feeling inferior and needing to please, if you're experiencing any compulsion or obsession or addiction, all of that and more are experiences of fear. And the opposite of that are experiences of love, which we experience as, as a gratitude or appreciation 
the caring, our reverence for life, our contentment, our awe at the universe. And so emotional awareness will show you if you're in fear or in love. And it's not always evident, but your body will not lie to you. So you put your attention, uh, say we'll start with your chest area. And you look for physical sensations, not sensations that are poetic like good, bad, up, down, bubbly, depressed. No, that's of no help to you at all. Physical sensations like mm, throbbing, aching, stabbing, stinging, contracting, burning. Yeah, constrictions, yeah. Constriction. And you look at your chest area, you put your attention into it. And you say, what am I feeling there in terms of physical sensations? Maybe you're feeling like a, a stabbing sensation in the upper left quadrant or a compression uh, across your chest. Now that is emotional awareness. Not I'm feeling bad, I'm feeling good, I have a heartache. No, that's emotional illiteracy. But what I've been describing to you is emotional literacy. And you do the same with your solar plexus area. You say, what am I experiencing there in terms of physical sensations? And you might be feeling butterflies, queasiness. You might be feeling a burning sensation throughout that area. Whatever you're feeling, it won't be comfortable. And it might be uncomfortable. It might be painful. The more you become emotionally aware, the more you'll see that fear is painful, physically painful. And you can do the same thing with your throat area, your fifth chakra, which has to do with communication. You can, you can uh, say, well, I, I feel a contraction in my throat. It was just above my chest. Uh, let's say, I'm just making this up now. Maybe it's about, it's the size of a ping pong ball and it hurts. So you are experiencing fear in yourself, a particular frightened part of your personality. And when you look at this, at the thoughts that this part of your personality is thinking, they will all be comparative, judgmental. There would be thoughts like, uh, oh, I'm not that good, I'll never be that good, or uh, now he's so stupid, or I'm so stupid. These are the things that frightened parts of your personality think. Now, here's why it's good to know when you're in fear. Because when you act from fear, you create painful, destructive consequences for yourself. When you act in anger, in judgment, with inferiority or superiority, when you're competitive and you act on that energy, you're creating destructive, unhealthy experiences, consequences for yourself. In other words, you're creating painful karma. When you act on a loving part of your personality, it's the opposite. You create healthy, constructive consequences for yourself. You create karma that you want to have more of. So as you develop the ability to distinguish within yourself between love and fear, and then the ability to choose love, that is a responsible choice. A choice that creates consequences for which you are willing to assume responsibility. So when you're experiencing a frightened part of your personality, let's say that, and you know it because your emotional awareness has shown you what it is physically in your energy processing system, <clears throat> your chakras, and in that moment that you're experiencing the physical pain of it, you're observing the judgmental thoughts of it. In that moment, you choose to put your awareness into a loving part of your personality, or as much as you can, what you can, as much as you can reach for. The time when you knew you were loved, or you knew you were loving, and act the best that you can from that part of your personality. That is the moment of creating authentic power. And the more that you do this, each time you do this, 
it, may, it, it doesn't change it immediately, but as you do it again and again and again, you begin to move beyond the control of that part of your personality. It, it's still there, still hurts, still thinks it's thoughts, but it doesn't control you. It doesn't penetrate you the way it did before. It begins to run off of you like water off the feathers of a duck. And in this way, you can look at this as developing mastery in your life because that's what you're doing. That's creating real power, authentic power. Not trying to change the world. That, that will, that cannot produce permanent changes in your awareness. It can make you temporarily happy. You want a girlfriend and you get one and suddenly you feel good. Everything feels good. It's just the, at the, as though you're at the top of a roller coaster. You can see for everywhere. And then the girlfriend says, I've been thinking about it, Amrit, and I don't think we're really meant for each other. In fact, I've met someone that I know I am meant for. And suddenly you go down all the way to the bottom. You plummet. But while you were there at the top, you felt exhilarated. You felt good. That's not joy. That's happiness. Happiness depends on what occurs in the physical world, in the external world. But when you create authentic power, and this is your discipline, you ignite joy inside yourself. And joy is not dependent on the physical world. And that's what creating authentic power does. It creates a life of awareness and purpose, joy, fulfillment, vitality, creativity, completion. This is what we were born to do. Hey, you're Inspired Tribe. I want to take a quick sec. I wanted to share something today with you that is really dear to my heart. And it's actually what keeps the entire ecosystem around the Inspired Evolution thriving, my one-on-one -on -one coaching. So it's basically coaching that helps you live a spiritually aligned life. I coach people from all different types of walks of life. These people are leaders and they're looking to have an incredible spiritual impact in the lives that they're leading for themselves and then also lead in alignment to their values. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. Here's a few people that have also transformed through my coaching and here's what they have to say. Amrit is a fantastic coach. In a few sessions, he got to a depth that I'd only experienced before working with certain medicines. And He's gone through a lot of the struggles that you're probably facing. Then my corporate banking job wasn't really doing it. You feel like you're not making progress towards your goals. And Amrit's been a really strong, supportive figure in my journey. I'm more in control of myself. I'm kinder to myself. I actually have that vision and a purpose. I do feel like I'm a better version of myself already. Amazing energy. He was easy to talk to, which made me easy to trust him. Working with Amrit at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and really I was bouncing out of bed. Whenever I get off the calls with Amrit, best money we've ever spent. <laughs> I would not recommend him because I don't want everyone to know about him and then I won't be able to book him. If he gets too busy, I won't get my turn. I would say absolutely. There's no way you can work with Amrit for a period of time without being transformed. So if you're considering him as a coach, do not hesitate because you won't be disappointed. As you guys can see, there's a lot of people all over the world from all these different corners experiencing incredible transformations. I don't think, if I can say humbly myself, that there is anything quite like this somewhere else online. Most people that you know have channels that you know grow and grow and grow don't really focus on one-to-one -one offerings. I have just found that it is the most profound space where you can bring yourself in a private container and really just share what's going on for yourself. And if you want to book in for that call with me, touch base, it's www amrit.coach forward slash life. That's www.amrit.coach forward slash L-I-F-E. There is a link in the show notes below to book in that call. And yeah, if you want to take your journey further, if you want to dive in deeper and you really want to live a spiritually aligned life, if it's for you, please do check it out. And without too much further ado, once again, for your spirit, for yourself, today's podcast. There's many threads in there to pick at. There is one that's just glaring at me in the face, which is the whole concept of control is quite 
We call it the belly of the beast. <laughs> but um, it's quite the beast. Um, and even because I can identify and I've seen this in myself and I've seen this in others, even transitioning from external power to internal power, the concept of surrendering the familiar, um, there is, as you described, there's a contraction there. There's so much fear to letting go of what we know, to move inwards. And then, you know, I feel like almost at different stages of the journey, different parts of fear do arise. It's like the letting go of what we know of, okay, I'm just going to learn to trust that I'm catered for in my 3D reality. Um, I'm going to source power within. And even looking within sometimes is quite the challenge and for others more so than than some. Um, but there is almost a fear to to go within for power um, and also a fear of letting go of the control for the external for power. And one of the other really profound pieces that I picked up from what you were sharing amongst other things just before was the fact that flow feels like love and that fear is synonymous with contraction or stuckness. You know, that's that was really profound to be able to tune into the body that way. You can say yes. something? Uh, you, 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 yes, I agree with what you just said, the last part. You need to look at the first part of what you said differently. And that is that uh, uh, you controlled, you put your hand right on it. That's what frightened parts of your personality do. They manipulate and they control the external world so that they will feel better about themselves. And it's not a matter of surrendering because the frightened parts of your personality are not going to change. They're not going to be manipulated. They manipulate. You can't make them feel better. You can't accept them, embrace them, kiss them, accept them, love them. Sure, you all do all of that that you want, but they're not going to change. They are not going to change. So the intention your intention becomes not changing these parts of your personality but moving beyond the control of them and then you are free of them and while they come you feel them i suggest that no one who's listening to us ever repress or suppress or deny an emotion but instead experience it fully completely at depth that's emotional awareness. And it's just and it takes courage. It takes courage. Because it is painful to look inside when you are in fear. Because fear is painful. It is always painful. And that's what five sensory personalities avoid or do their best, but they can't. They can't. What can you do? I was addicted to sex for years, decades. Some people are addicted to alcohol, some to drugs. Some can't stop shopping or eating or gambling. Some can't stop speaking or buying clothes. But the pain is there. The pain serves a purpose. The pain is the pain of powerlessness. The pain of powerlessness is something we all have, whether we're five sensory or we're multi sensory. It is the pain of feeling unwanted, undeserving, unlovable. It's the pain of wanting to belong and not belonging. It's the pain of wanting to love and knowing that you're not capable. It's the pain of so much needing to be loved and realizing you're unlovable and you're always going to be. It's the experience of being intrinsically flawed inherently defective and it's excruciating that's the pain of powerlessness that remains the same what is different is this five sensory personalities when they experience that pain reach outward that's what a frightened part of the personality does it reaches outward to change the world so they'll be out of the pain it could be bourbon could be sex, could be workaholism, perfectionism, but the pain will be there. 
The pain of a frightened part of your personality is the universe's way of bringing your attention to a part of your personality that you need to experience and move beyond the control of in order to give the gifts that you were born to give. And that's where your joy comes into your life and your fulfillment and vitality and meaning and cope and creativity is in giving the gifts you were born to give. And you cannot do that while you're in a frightened in the control of a frightened part of your personality. You cannot. Uh, love and fear are mutually exclusive in the earth school. When you are in love, there's no fear. You cannot fear. You love. And when you are in fear, you cannot love. This is our path to the earth school. And it's not a should. It's not a you must. You don't go to hell or get punished if you don't follow it. You don't change. If you want to change, this is the only way that you can. It's now counterproductive to try to make yourself feel better by changing the world. That produces only violence and destruction. Creating authentic power is the only path now to love, to peace, to generosity, to caring, to contentment, to generosity. Because that was going to definitely stack into where one of my questions was going to go because this internal power definitely speaks to this concept of internal peace. Can we call it authentic as opposed to internal? Yeah, absolutely. Because, because it is a different uh, it is a different experience. It's mm. real power. Mm. When you change yourself, you put your attention inside yourself and change yourself with your own emotional awareness and volition, which is responsible choice. These changes you make in yourself are permanent. That power mm. is real. And that's why and I also appreciate what you're saying because internal makes it seem localized, whereas authentic right. makes it seem global. It is. You are yeah. global. You are much yeah. more than global. Much more. Yeah. <laughs> you are a universal soul. human. <laughs> you are a powerful, creative, yes, compassionate, and loving spirit. Mm. And, um, yeah, the. There was two points that were speaking to me. The first one, which maybe we can elaborate on, but the the almost it seems like a necessary ingredient for transformation between the gap between love and fear then is courage is a necessary ingredient for maturity because courage is that, you know, that force that allows us to sort of walk towards fear. Because I remember there was a visceral point in my life where I was, I was, Gary, it's almost embarrassing to admit, but I was about 30 when I start, when I really understood the definition of courage. I thought courage and fearlessness were the exact same thing for the longest while up until that point. And it was only at about 30, I remember I had this moment of divine intervention is all I can probably say, and I picked up my phone and I was Googling the word courage, a weird intervention, but an intervention nonetheless. And I've Googled the word courage, and as I'm reading it, I'm having a full-on epiphany because the realization was, oh, courage is not the absence of fear, not at all. Courage is absolutely having fear and taking steps towards that fear despite the fear. And I remember reading this and going, oh, holy shit, part of my French, but courage is a skill. <laughs> it's like something you work on. And develop by actually, you know, moving towards what your biggest fears are. And, you know, you can actually, and I associated myself maybe because I'm a male, but I'm sure females have this to some degree as well as part of the human experience. I'm strong, I'm vital, you know, I'm courageous. It's something we inherently want to identify with. But then realizing that, oh, courage is a skill, something I need to develop upon. Um, and it's something I can work with because fearlessness has this connotation of you either are or you aren't that way. 
Um, whereas courage opened up this whole rabbit hole of, oh, this is a workable skill. It's malleable. It's something if, you know. And so what I'm hearing in our conversation at this point is the the shift towards authentic power is also a maturity and the mature like a like a soul's maturity or a spiritual maturity, but that spiritual evolution or maturity, however I want to describe it, um, courage is a necessary precursor um, as a piece of the work and a necessary ingredient. Yes, it is. We have um, Linda created the spirit, uh, the uh, authentic power guidelines, and I think they're posted on our website, seatofthesoul.com. And the first one, the first, there's four things that I needed, courage, Commitment is the first one. Then comes courage, compassion, and conscious communication and action. They're not necessarily in that order. Courage, um, I, I agree with you exactly. Um, by the way, in my experience, there's no gap between love and fear that we need to fill. You're either in love or you're in fear. And it's a matter of recognizing which one and choosing which one you're going to move forward in. That's the ability to create authentic power, to distinguish within yourself between love and fear and choose love no matter what's happening inside of you, like depression, helplessness, hopelessness, rage, anger, and choosing love. Or no matter what's happening outside of you, like another 9-11 type event, and choosing love. Now, when it comes to courage, it's not a matter only of courage, but of how you use it. For example, I used to think, uh, well, let me put it this way. I have a lot of courage, but I never thought very much about how I was using it. I was feeling so inadequate, so much needing to be loved, so much needing to be admired that I actually um, um, joined the infantry, became an officer, Came a Green Beret in Vietnam. And I thought I was doing things that required a lot of courage. And they did. For example, uh, maybe parachuting at night with equipment at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, from a C-130 aircraft. Uh, or parachuting from a helicopter into the ocean off Okinawa. Um, or going on a top secret mission um, from Vietnam into Laos. All of those took courage, and I thought that I was using my courage the way courage is meant to be used. And I was trying to impress others, but really I was trying to impress myself. I was trying to show others that I'm lovable, I'm admirable. And I was trying to demonstrate that, or at least try to convince myself of that. But those things don't take as much courage as creating authentic power. There's, I've never found anything yet that requires more courage than uh, stopping in myself a power struggle between me and Linda. to choose not to have the last word, not to speak louder, not to shout louder, not to huff off or huff off, or whatever you want to call it, to leave in fear, in judgment, and disdain. That takes courage. That takes a lot of courage. And that's the courage that's required in creating authentic power. So, yes, courage is important, and yes, courage is ex exactly as you realized it to be. But how are you using your courage now? Are you using it to do something to impress others? Or are you using it to experience and look at your fear and change it in yourself? Yeah takes courage. That is the new use of courage. So I can specify the difference. There's the old use of courage, which is what I was doing in Vietnam when I was a Green Beret officer. 
And the new use of courage is what I'm doing now when I feel judgmental towards someone and I decide I'm not going to speak that. I'm not going to act it out. I'm not even going to express it in my energy because I don't want it in me. Because when I act on it, whether no one else knows it or only I, but if I know it, it's enough. It creates negative karma, painful karma for me. And, uh, and I've been doing that a lot in my life prior to creating authentic power. And now I use my, I use my courage in a new way. And I support you. And not only you, Amrit, you are doing that, but everyone that's listening to us. There's a gap that's opened up in my awareness, and I'd love for you to help me bridge it, which is you've used the term creating authentic power prior. My awareness is previously that authentic power is, and I'm to create the necessary conditions within myself to allow authentic power to emerge. Do we create authentic power no. or do we create the conditions for authentic power? Yes, uh, that's, that's a good question. We create authentic power. You don't create conditions and then it happens. You either do or you don't. It's like Yoda said, do or do not. I'm frightened, for example. Pardon, it's not I. When you put those powerful words, I am, and connect it with something, you are invoking. Pay attention to that. But when you speak accurately and you say, a frightened part of my personality is judging. And it knows that someone is just really worthy of judgment. This person is a low life form. This person should not be walking the earth. This person, this is an exaggerated example. Or is it? Is that not something similarly, similar to what we feel when we judge? It's what I feel when I judge. So for me, It is a matter of choosing not to act on a frightened part of my personality. It's as simple as that, choosing not to act on it. And it's difficult because it's difficult because frightened parts of the personality are magnetically attractive. They're calling you. They're righteous. They're right. Go ahead. Tell him, tell him what he really is. He needs to know. Are you going to speak that way or not? Are you going to act on that energy or not? And our fundamental religions are some of them. The one I'm thinking of is Christianity and Buddhism. Um, and maybe in others too, but I don't know. But in these two, the central figure was tempted, Christ and the Buddha. Put it this way, Jesus and the young man, the young prince that became the Buddha. And in both cases, it's presented mythologically as a time uh, in which demons came and they were throwing spears at him. The spears were temptations. And that happened to Siddhartha under the Bodhi tree. And it happened to Christ in the desert. And it happens to you all the time. And a frightened part of your personality becomes active and it wants to have its way. It will have its way. But what is your will? Do you choose love or choose fear? And so to create authentic power, we loop back to where we were in the conversation around that emotional awareness of the self, feeling into our energy centers, feeling where there's constriction, where we're stuck, where there's flow, and that's us building actively authentic power. That is you experiencing and developing emotional awareness. That's a part. Once you have emotional awareness, you can use it to know 
when you are in fear or when you are in love. Don't think you always know. Usually if something's painful enough, you know. But I remember once I was having a conversation with someone I didn't know in a coffee shop, and he just said knowingly, mmm, jealousy. I said, who? I said, you. I said, no, I'm not jealous. I was. Emotional awareness will always show you if you're experiencing a frightened part of your personality or a loving part of your personality. Creating authentic power requires in that moment of experiencing fully a frightened part of your personality, putting your attention on a loving part and choosing to act from that loving part while you're experiencing the frightened part. That's the moment. That's where the spiritual rubber meets the road. And all the things that we've been talking about in terms of fear are so in terms of love. Your emotional awareness will show you when love is present. And you'll feel it in terms of wonderful physical sensations, the kind that you want to experience more of. And then you cultivate the loving part of your personality. You notice it. You benchmark it. You don't let it pass as, a, as an ephemeral, good feeling, fleeting experience of generosity or appreciation. You recognize it. This is a loving part of my personality. And I am going to remember it. I'm going to cultivate it. I am right now. And I'm going to return to it when I'm in a frightened part of my personality. And I need a loving part of my personality to reach for. Here's one right now. These things together are the creation of authentic power. The size of your fear in comparison to that loving part. Yeah, goes back to the size of the courage that's required to face the fear. Because I can imagine in some parts the pain and the fear can be quite large. In other parts, I'm sure it's smaller than the loving part. Some of those... You just read in that armor, or you're speaking from experience? We both um, know you from experience. You're human. The mm. frightened parts are excruciating. Mm. They can be so excruciating that you don't want to live. Mm. So you say, take me. Take me now. I can't take this anymore. Choice is central in the earth school. This is a domain of duality. Every this has a that. And the fundamental duality in the earth school is love and fear. When you get to the bedrock, can't get any bottom, lower, deeper, that's love, or is it fear? Why am I doing this? Is it love or is it fear? Is it for myself? Is it to feel better? Is it to accomplish something? Is it to gain? something? Is it out of generosity that's spontaneous? Is it out of joy? Is it from love? That's the choice. And we have that. And it's not as though the fear is bigger than the love. The love's bigger than the fear. It's not a matter of what metric you're using. It's a matter of energy. It's a matter of put it this way. Fear is illusion. The illusion, the illusion. The Hindus called that the goddess Kali. She's the illusion. Your most meaningful moment in all your life and eternity is a trinket on her anklet and it tingles and she dances. That's Kali. That's the illusion. Love is real. Love is not an illusion. Love is the only thing that is real. And eventually you will come to understand that love heals everything and love is all there is. This is the journey through the earth school. Eventually you will take it with more and more awareness but there is no judgment, there's no punishment if you don't, there's no reward if you do. 
the choice is yours. The choice is always yours and yours alone. And the consequences that you create are always for you. And you will experience them. It is an amazing, awesome domain of experience, of awareness, and of responsibility. This is the Earth School. Do you mind me asking, Gary, how your love for yourself and for Linda, because <laughs> I know a lot of your love for Linda is also your ability to love her has um, evolved, matured. Is it the same um, since her no, transition? Mature is, what, I'm sure that, mature, yeah. mature is what personalities do. Evolve okay. is what evolve. Do yes, you mentioned this. I'm and, catching and on I, I slowly, mean, though. <laughs> Oh, I, I don't mean for this to be a you know, study in semantics. I've just found that the vocabulary of authentic power is voluntary, as every vocabulary is. But this one happens to be more precise, more accurate, or more helpful. Words carry consciousness. And when you use a word, you express the consciousness. And as you become aware, you express the consciousness that you choose with the words that you choose consciously. I've forgotten what you just asked me. Um, what did you <laughs> say it again? It was, um, if it was okay to ask you, and it may not be, it may be too tender, and I totally respect and honor that as well. It was more oh, yes. the pain and the... You know, we were talking about pain and transformation, and then we were talking about the nature of love, um, and yeah, how love is real and fear is illusion. We were discussing Kali, and I was inquiring about your personal love for Linda, um, and that love being, in my humble opinion, so real, um, love being real, and then has that evolved? Um, since her transition from this earthly plane, or has it remained the same? Because love is real, and trying to understand the evolution of love. Love is real, in my understanding. Not understanding, because these things are not understandable. But my experience is that is different. Linda and I experienced a love that was remarkable, and we knew it was. I loved her. I loved her completely. Early on, when we were together, I realized it's not that I love Linda. I love loving Linda. I love loving her. And we lived a life that was remarkable. Every morning, every night, I said, I love you, beloved, because I never heard those words from my parents, and I was determined. I never had a relationship before, and I was determined that I would not let this one be like that. And my love for her was so easy, so complete, so full, so there. And then when her soul went home, um, we both had teachers, same teachers. And uh, the first thing, well, I never experienced pain like that. When I got back to the house and Linda wasn't there and driving back and the world seemed to be going on in its way without knowing that the sun has just turned black. And doesn't anyone understand what's happening and the magnitude of it? Look, they're just driving their cars and going to a soccer game. When I got home, the pain was so much, I'd never experienced anything like that. And I set the intention not to squander that pain, not even one small bit of it. Because I know that everything that happens to me in the earth school 
is for my spiritual growth. And this is no exception. And this pain was big. I was going to say Mount Shasta, which I know well. This is bigger than Everest. This is huge. And it's not moving. And it's there. And I can't go around it or under it or through it. It's just there. And that's what I decided to experience every bit of it. It was a couple of days later, I think. I was sitting, watching the trees move gently in the wind. And I had a realization that I don't have a... The realization was I don't have a reason for living anymore except to love people. I might have thought that before. I might have even said that before. But it was so. And it hasn't changed. It's permanent. So in that process, about two weeks later, I was able to talk with one of our teachers again. And I was talking about this love. Because I was thinking of it just that way. It was, I always thought of it that way. We knew it was special. In fact, one of our teachers even told us, told me, don't think that what you are experiencing with Linda is ordinary. It's not. And we knew it wasn't. But when I was talking with that teacher, I was sort of reminiscing, floating in a reverie of how amazing our love was. And all of it focused on one precious beloved that was in that space. And the teacher said, now let your love encompass all your beloveds. It took me a long time to begin to, I heard the words, to begin to even absorb them in some way. So I set the intention to do that. And I asked the teacher, why am I hurting so much? And the teacher said, <clears throat> because frightened parts of your personality demand that the world be the way it wants. And then it said, let that go. That has nothing to do with your love for Linda. Your love for Linda is apart from the earth school and beyond it. And later, as this process continued, and by the way, I wrote some personal messages while I was experiencing these things, and I put them on our website, seatofthesoul.com. If you go there, just look for, I think it's Linda Francis Celebration, something like that. I'll put and you'll see a video. In the show notes below. Yeah. And you'll see those 11 personal messages that I wrote in the moment, so I wouldn't have to recall them from memory later. And it's changed me. I look at so many people now as my beloved. And I was told, I was taught in this process that the love that two people feel between themselves and the earth school or among themselves or between themselves and the earth school is a learning experience of the love that is the universe. And the teacher said, now, Garrett, you are going to experience that love itself. So, yes, the love that Linda and I experienced transformed me beyond anything I could have imagined, did imagine, ever had imagined. I never experienced love like that. I never. And when her soul went home, she gave me a gift, maybe even more powerful, to move beyond that. Now, do I still love Linda? Yes. In every way I can love her. She's not an incarnation. She's not. Her incarnation is gone, dead. It's not coming back. 
but the energy, the love, the voice, that's real. And it's there. I don't know how to picture Linda. I can't picture a soul. No one can. But I know I love her. <clears throat> and in fact, it's interesting that we should be talking about this now because only in the last few days, <coughs> pardon me, has something happened. I would say so much, especially in the first year and several months. Are you with me, beloved? And she said, yes, I'm with you. Are you with me, beloved? Yes, I'm with you. And then I would say, I love you, beloved, in the morning and the evening, but there was pain to it. There was pain. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I was, I think I was trying to make the connection, maybe sure I still love her, I love her. I knew I love her, but I love you, beloved, it had pain in it. And then in the last few days, an old energy has come back. From when I used to tell Linda every morning and every night, I love you, beloved, there was no second agenda <laughs> None. I just wanted her to know that she is loved. I love you, beloved. And I found myself saying that to her now. After 15, 16 months, it's back. That energy is back. I can't say it. I love you, beloved. Without an agenda. Just as a gift. Because I want her to know that she's loved. And it doesn't matter that I know that I know that she's loved because she's in non-physical reality. She's in the perfection of all that is. I'm, I know about that. I don't know that. But I do know that I love her. And that hasn't stopped. <laughs> oh, epic. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Yeah. So much love for her. <laughs> and yeah, just, yeah. And the love you share and the love that is. And yeah, so much love for love and the realness of it and how much it helps us on our path. It is the path. <laughs> hey, you're Inspired Tribe. I want to take a quick sec. I wanted to share something today with you that is really dear to my heart. And it's actually what keeps the entire ecosystem around the Inspired Evolution thriving my one-on-one -on -one coaching. So it's basically coaching that helps you live a spiritually aligned life. I coach people from all different types of walks of life. These people are leaders and they're looking to have an incredible spiritual impact in the lives that they're leading for themselves and then also lead in alignment to their values. Now you don't have to take my word for it. Here's a few people that have also transformed through my coaching and here's what they have to say. Amrit is a fantastic coach. In a few sessions, he got to a depth that I'd only experienced before working with certain medicines. And He's gone through a lot of the struggles that you're probably facing. Then my corporate banking job wasn't really doing it. You feel like you're not making progress towards your goals. And Amrit's been a really strong, supportive figure in my journey. I'm more in control of myself. I'm kinder to myself. I actually have that vision and a purpose. I do feel like I'm a better version of myself already. Amazing energy. He was easy to talk to, which made me easy to trust him. Working with Amrit at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and really I was bouncing out of bed. Whenever I get off the calls with Amrit, best money we've ever spent. <laughs> I would not recommend him because I don't want everyone to know about him and then I won't be able to book him. If he gets too busy, I won't get my turn. I would say absolutely. There's no way you can work with Amrit for a period of time without being transformed. So if you're considering him as a coach, do not hesitate because you won't be disappointed. As you guys can see, there's a lot of people all over the world from all these different corners experiencing incredible transformations. I don't think, if I can say humbly myself, that there is anything quite like this somewhere else online. Most people that you know have channels that you know grow and grow and grow don't really focus on one-to-one -one offerings. I have just found that it is the most profound space where you can bring yourself in a private container and really just share what's going on for yourself. And if you want to book in for that call with me, touch base, it's www amrit.coach forward slash life. That's www.amrit.coach forward slash L-I-F-E. There is a link in the show notes below to book in that call. And yeah, if you want to take your journey further, if you want to dive in deeper and you really want to live a spiritually aligned life, if it's for you, please do check it out. And without too much further ado, once again, for your spirit, for yourself, today's podcast. 
it's no comfortable segue into this next little bit um, from this space, but I think when we're discussing authentic power, it's the last little chapter I wanted to sort of address in today's podcast was this creating authentic power and the external world that we've been discussing and I don't want to turn this podcast into a political drama by any means but more just again some of us that feel like we're called to building the path for authentic power we feel challenged at times by going okay I'm going to build this authentic power I'm going to one of the things I'm going to do is take my attention from fear place it in love I'm going to make the conscious choice and yet there are others that are not making the choice who are more manipulative and their manipulations have more power and weight in the world, it seems at the moment in the 3D reality. And there seems to be a whole myriad of stuff that gets muddy and mud gets kicked up in internal systems and in external systems as well as we start to address that. I know in our purest, most loving moments, we recognise as you meant, said before, that the work is with it. Uh, the work is for us to evolve ourselves and not to try and change the planet. But it can be disheartening, I guess, when we see. I don't want to place blame, but you know, different individuals operating from different operating systems. I guess I'm inviting you to help us reconcile and bring us home to the fact that really this is the most important work that we can do with on building authentic power with with ourselves um, and then just the, the help of just a little bit more to trust that that is the most important thing and that the, the external wars and conflicts and things like that not will resolve but, you know, this, this building of authentic power internally is actually the most important thing and how it, attempts to reconcile some of those external stories. Sorry, it's a big question, I know, and it's not quite segued in correctly, but I think it's very important. It doesn't need a segue. It is what is. Mm. And when you create authentic power, you do it for yourself. You can't do it for anyone else because no one knows your intentions except you. No one feels the physical sensations in your body of love and fear, except you. No one makes the choice and can make the choice except you between love and fear. It's natural to find spiritual partners, which are individuals that are oriented as you. They know that they have souls. They know there's a reason that they're together and that that reason has something to do with their souls. It can be a family, a a, a couple. It can be a class, but they are together to assist one another in creating authentic power. Now to your question directly. What can you do about, now I can start naming conflicts before the history of Babylon and go through the Roman conquest, Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great, but a better name would be Alexander the Terrified. He couldn't stop fighting. He needed to prove himself. He put his name on 20 cities. And all the way through the devastation of the world wars and then the wars that have followed that, and the conflicts that could explode into larger wars that we're still experiencing. And now your question is, yeah, well, what about that? Where does authentic power fit into that? Everywhere, everywhere. Have you not been such a person? No, let me put it in the first person. I have been such a person. I was a Green Beret officer, Amrit. I empathized with them. I understood them. Let's kick butt. Let's get this world in shape. It doesn't work. 
doesn't know. There is a five sensory superstition that there is a difference, a barrier, an uncrossable barrier between in here and out there. And that's why from that perception, it is impossible that inner transformation can bring about outer change. But that superstition is beginning to fade now as we become multi-sensory. And we begin to experience that there is no difference between in here and out there. If you intend to change the world, there's only one way you can. That's to change yourself. But here's the thing. If you're changing yourself in order to change the world, you're still pursuing external power. If you're pursuing love because that's your fulfillment, because that's your heart, because you're coming to love everything that's alive and everyone that you meet, that is the world that you are bringing into being. If you forget that, you'll continue to create violence and destruction. That's what, that's the only thing that the pursuit of external power can now produce. If you want to transform yourself from someone who judges, then you change. Here's another way of looking at it. When you judge someone or something, a war, a person, a behavior, it's as though you step into darkness. You recognize that they're in darkness, but when you judge them, you yourself also step into the darkness. And there's no remedy for a darkness. The darkness isn't a thing, it's an absence. Evil is an absence, it's not something that you can imprison. What can you do to an absence? You cannot. The only remedy for an absence is a presence. The only remedy for darkness is light. The only remedy for fear is love. And it can come from only one place you. But you might say, wait, Gary, you just said that love is the universe. Yes, it is. And you are a unique expression of the universe. Our consciousness is moving places we never dreamed it could have moved. And as I can say things like I just said, I look back and I see that that wisdom was hidden in plain sight all this time. Linda and I were adopted into Lakota culture. And the Lakota say, the center of the universe is everywhere. I did not realize what that means. What they're saying. I have a friend who's been a clergyman for, I think about 70 or 70, about 70 years. He's 93 or 95 now. And I ask him, Cliff, is there, is there anything in Christian theology or scripture to indicate that the universe might be inside us. And he looked at me for a moment. I said, well, what's wrong with you? And then he said, the kingdom of heaven is within. Again, yes, it's right there. We've been reading it. We've been hearing it. But because it's so disjunct from our experience, because we were five sensory. It meant nothing, nothing. Just poetic, maybe inspiring words. No, they're not poetic. They are inspiring because they're true. The kingdom of heaven, which is what? Love, the absence of fear. A kingdom, a realm, absent of fear. Divinity with a capital D. That's inside. And if you try to change it, 
You can. I understand that uh, Christ was offered command of an army called Zealots to kick the Romans out of Palestine. If he had chosen to do that, no one would know the name Jesus. But he chose. And don't think that he wasn't tempted. Even the Bible says he was tempted. But he was tempted, this man, Jesus. And it was in keeping with his being that for a moment, the seduction of the entire world was attractive. But he chose and his frightened parts were as strong and he chose to go beyond his personality. He saw that what awaited him if he did that, if he chose the path of glory was mastery and the position of mastery. And so he became the compassionate master of the earth, able to heal, able to change, able to assist people in changing themselves, nothing more. That, but that is everything. And now I'm not Christian, but why is it that this one act and by the way, for a long time, I wanted nothing to do with Christianity. That was the brutal origin of, of the Crusades, of the, quote, Holy Roman Inquisition, tortured to death of thousands. But I can see now why there was so much impact. Because what? Because, let me put it this way, nothing can be done that is more powerful. Nothing can bring from the non-physical world more protection, more support than an individual choosing, reaching for authentic power and choosing to enact a will that is higher than its own or the good of the species, or the good of life. That's what this young man, Jesus, did. And he became the Christ. Nothing is more powerful than an act like that. So, as you go through your path, with the latest war here and the latest conflict there and the latest discord and there'll be more and more of it because this world of five sensory limitation is disintegrating it was built on the perception of power and the understanding of power as the ability to manipulate and to control and that's now poisonous and all of our social structures are now disintegrating and they can't be salvaged because they're not broken. They're obsolete. They don't serve our evolution. And new social structures are emerging that are based on the understanding of power as alignment of the personality with the soul. All of them, commerce, education, governance. And we're in the midst of that, aren't we? We're in the midst of it. No humans have ever stood in this place before where for just a few human generations, we have one foot in, a, in the dying consciousness and one foot in a consciousness that's being born. And we choose between those two with every decision we make. I've heard you describe spiritual evolution can be summarized as selflessness many times. And thank you so much for... Yeah, we're marking upon Jesus' path. No. Well, when you, I, I, I agree with what you said. I'd like to elaborate on it some. 
not much, but a big elaboration. If you say self, selflessness means I don't have any sense of self. Well, that means at one time you had a sense of yourself. If you have a sense of yourself, you have a sense of other. One of the things we're beginning to see is that there is no other. We have to act on that if we choose. Always, if we choose, if we choose. The last little stone I wanted to turn over because it was connected in a few threads that we've been talking and you've mentioned the word karma a few times. And yeah, even as we're describing the path that you just described, there's this really, you call karma a delivery system. And uh, the way I, I read it was, you know, when you send out a package, it could be a deed, could be a word, you infuse it with your consciousness and your intention. And what comes back to you is actually determined by that intention. Um, what comes back to you is what you sent out. And just it focuses so like, because, you know, we can do a deed unconsciously or we can do a deed consciously and weave our intention completely into it. Um, and, yeah, just really, for me, just feels like a real sharp, like solid nugget in this place of authentic power to be conscious of how important our intention is. And even, you know, as you were finding out the kinks between even the terminology of Alexander the Great being Alexander the Terrified, you know, and then the terror that one must experience and the subsequent intention and the karma that's created subsequently from, you know, a place from having a real awareness of your intention and what you're creating really, I believe, is important to fit into this conversation for authentic power. Why don't we talk about it the next time we get together? I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, guys. He committed to another one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Gary, on that note, then, thank you so much. Seriously. I Well, seriously and joyfully. <laughs> oh, goodness me. It is such, um, yeah. I, again, can thank you for your time and presence, but I know on behalf of myself and the Inspired Evolution Tribe and audience and everyone that's following along this conversation, these conversations enrich us no end and, you know, the, the depths you're willing to plumb with us in these conversations is absolutely not lost on us. Like just the openness, the transparency and just, you know, I admittedly have asked some really emotional and potent questions um, to be able to better understand love and yeah I just really really respect and love your work and you so much for just helping bring us home to more and more levels of love within our being to build that authentic power I'm so grateful for you in this conversation thank you you're welcome Amrit and the reason I enjoy being with you so much is because of those questions because they're real that's what changes that's what goes to the heart that's the meaning of life it goes to that what is your meaning in life. It goes that deep. Everything does. It's just a matter of your awareness. Thank you for inviting me. It's a joy to be with you again. Thank you for your blessing. Hey there, guys. You made it all the way through to the end of another episode. I am so inspired by your inspiration to evolve. Man, we are truly on this journey together. It is such an honor to be your brother walking this path home by your side. Now, if you loved this conversation, you are going to love our previous conversation with Gary. Please do go check it out. I'll put a link to it right here, right here for you to go check out now.